Welcome, welcome everyone. I'm Jackie Ott Jacola, Executive Director of Every Cat Health Foundation. We will give everyone just a few minutes uh, to gather in what is our first webinar of 2022. So again, welcome. We are so excited to uh, have our sponsor Antec here with us today. We have some great things lined up for you. I would like to mention also coming up in July, July 8th and 9th, we can pop to the next slide. We will be also celebrating with Antec and hosting a symposium with other sponsors at the University of Florida in Gainesville, also here for you virtually, a symposium, Health Breakthroughs for Every Cat, FIP and beyond, and registration, I am excited to say, is opening in a couple days, so please keep checking our website, everycat.org, for updates, for registration, and thank you again to Antec, who are partners uh, in this effort, along with uh, many other sponsors, and we will be able to bring this to you July 8th and 9th, and also offer in-person registration as well. So today I would like to introduce first Denise Sapp, who is the Director of Commercial Marketing for Antec, and she has the privilege of introducing our guest speaker. So you guys, I will let you take it away and everyone please enjoy the webinar. Thanks so much, Jackie. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Ringer and Treating Ringworm. Uh, today's webinar will be led by Dr. Jennifer Lopez. Her veterinary interests include dermatology, surgery, and emergency care. She loves to interact with clients and pets, which is why she recently left clinical practice to take on the position of professional service veterinarian um, with us here at Antec. Dr. Lopez's fur babies include two French bulldogs, Roxy Razzle Dazzle and King Pickle, and a miniature red poodle Clifford, who she affectionately calls Poodle. Before I hand it over to Dr. Lopez, I'd, I'd like to remind everyone that the Q&A functionality is located at the bottom of your control panel. We will answer all questions at the completion of the webinar. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Lopez. Awesome. Thank you guys uh, for joining me. Um, Good afternoon uh, all across the, the hopefully United States. You guys are tuning in to learn a little bit more about um, dermatophytes. Um, and so I'm gonna actually just turn my camera off. You guys don't wanna see me, you wanna see more of the screen and, and, and there's a lot of things going on in the background. So I'll just do that. Um, but I did kind of wanna uh, talk to you a little bit about my passion, uh, dermatology. I love a good skin crusty lesion on any dog or cat. Um, so hopefully we're gonna kind of put the fun back in fungal when we talk a little bit more about ringworm and then um, hopefully not make you too itchy that you actually take home a couple of nuggets of knowledge. Um, so we'll go over some of the causes of ringworm um, that really like to flourish in our dogs and cats, especially as we're getting nice and warm um, across the United States. And so also we're going to talk a little bit more about the clinical presentation, um, maybe a little bit how to integrate some diagnostics that we have available, um, and then maybe um, a couple of case examples that we all um, want to hear about. So um, let's talk more about ringworm. I always like to say that it's not a worm. Um, we kind of know that that ringworm appearance comes from like circular kind of like hair loss lesion scaling um, we usually see pets when they have a ringworm um, usually occurs on the face the ears and feet and tail and so those kind of like superficial layers that we think of on the skin but also to the hair and the nails um, and so sometimes it might be not as um, straightforward as we think because it could always have a really wide range of appearances in some animals um, it can maybe be a little bit more um, obvious and then others um, they look completely normal like this cute little um, King Charles Cavalier on the screen and they could have some lesions underneath that hair so kind of the most common fungal things that we're dealing with the species are going to be that microsporum canis that we have up on the screen microsporum gypsum and then trichophyton mentagrophytes, which is a nice big kind of uh, a swallow full of words. And so I also just kind of call it T-mentag, just as a, a shortened. Um, so don't be fooled by just kind of those uh, rings 
We like to say um, those raised rings that call ringworm um, because they could potentially just be bacteria. So I know it's it's kind of confusing. We always like to say if it looks like ringworm, it's probably staph. Um, I heard that as a technician and also as a, a veterinarian or kind of baby vet in, uh, in vet school. So um, really nice to kind of use our diagnostics that we have available, the PCRs, the DTMs, um, so we can get that definitive diagnosis. Um, so when we think about who gets ringworm, um, we like to think about kind of kitten season as it's coming. All ages, all animals can be affected, um, but ringworm is probably the most common in young puppies and kittens older dogs and cats, and then of course ones with um, kind of compromised immune systems. So a little bit sick, um, our immune system's a little bit kind of down, those are kind of the, the likely targets. And so the warmer the area, the more animals are gonna be exposed, of course, and there's always a seasonality to the infection. So um, we know that there are some poster children I put up there in parentheses breed. Uh, we like our Persians and our Yorkies, um, but a lot of the time too, animals that live or kind of have close contact with other infected dogs or maybe animals that roam um, a lot, uh, outside a lot or allowed to go out um, often have a higher risk. So I kind of want to bring to you about Persians just because I, I love a good smushy faced uh, cat and dog. Um, and so Persians are actually um, believed to be predisposed to fungal skin infections and they tend to form on uh, diseases that actually are more severe and they're more persistent than other cats, unfortunately. So it's usually thought to the like long coat and then also the gene that allows for that long luscious uh, locks of hair. And so what's important to remember is just being very kind of particular when you are looking um, at these cats, um, longer breed cat hair as well, because there could be some areas that look a little crusty that could potentially be ringworm. Um, one thing to mention too is it doesn't matter about the serial positivity of a cat. So if we're either FIV positive or FELV positive, it does not increase the risk of them getting a uh, ringworm. And so most people think that that could potentially be the, the, the case, but um, it's not. Um, there's been several studies that have kind of shown that. But um, when we're trying to think about, you know, how do we actually contact ringworm? Um, we have to think also too about that lifestyle. So what I mentioned before, you know, are we getting groomed more frequently? Um, are we traveling more, getting boarded? things like that can always affect um, our animals that we're seeing. So that also too kind of comes into our lifestyle and health status, right? Um, they all have a lot to do with each other. So when we're thinking about lifestyle, it's gonna increase that exposure. So if we have maybe some um, uh, working dogs or hunting dogs, of course, if they're in areas where there's a lot of stress going on, maybe large catteries, um, even animals that are in shelters or even with rescue situations, they could be a little bit more uh, prone to developing um, ringworm in certain cases. But really for a dermatophyte infection to happen, there has to be some sort of microtrauma. So when I say microtrauma, it's more like a skin injury. So if we have maybe like a break in the skin, you know, it doesn't have to be like a huge scratch or a deep kind of um, laceration or something like that. It might not even be visible, but any break in the skin is gonna allow that ringworm to kind of get in there and cause that may be superficial dermatitis to then turn out to be a fungal infection. So usually kind of mild cases start off that way and we're always looking for that, just that small little area that could potentially cause uh, that micro trauma. So why is it such a big deal? Um, why do we care about ringworm so much? Um, we care because grandma can get it. Um, a lot of the things you know, are zoonotic to the point where if animals have it in our household, then we could potentially be exposed. So if we get technical and kind of you know, throw that gross factor out there, um, you can kind of say that ringworm is almost like a flesh eating fungus that's consuming dead skin cells um, if we kind of want to get crazy. Um, but it's probably not going to go over well uh, when we start to kind of explain these things to um, pet owners. And so it's a 
it's a big problem when we start to think about the constantness of the sloughing of the skin, because if you're maybe putting your um, uh, elbows on that table in the uh, exam room, or maybe you're laying uh, on that blanket in that kennel and it hasn't been cleaned, or you're using that uh, brush and combing, you know, the multiple cats that are in the household, that could potentially be a way of transmission. And so those three main ways of contact, fomites, and the environment is is less common, um, but that direct contact with an infected animal or even a person um, or even by handling any of those contaminated objects could really cause um, a big spread. And that's definitely not something that we want or we want to contribute to. And so obviously we're very uh, good about uh, washing our hands now since the past few years with COVID, um, maybe masks and gloves and stuff. Um, and so, you know, using that ability to wash our hands well is going to be really important if we do have a, a positive animal or maybe an infected animal that we think might have ringworm. So if you're going to maybe put a, a lab coat on or like a, a, a sweater or a jacket or an overcoat, make sure that you take that off um, after you're in contact with that patient or even just changing scrubs or um, shirt and top and so I remember one time uh, I was a I was working as a technician in a local hospital down in Florida and Miami and um, we had uh, uh, several animals that tested positive for ringworm and my mom didn't let me in the house until I completely stripped in the garage and threw everything in the in the um, laundry so kind of similar to that but really the best way to disinfect too besides washing hands is going to be that one to ten dilution of chlorine bleach so if you don't prefer bleach um, or if maybe you have some allergies to it, there's lots of new disinfecting compounds that are out there. So just check the label, see kind of what dilutions or contact time is needed for dermatophytes. So really a great way to get rid of that um, in house and then also in hospital or with any sort of contact um, anywhere else. So a little fun fact I threw at the bottom is that the most common type of human dermatophyte is actually not zoonotic. It's called trichophyte fight in rubrum and it's known as jock itch or uh, athlete's foot so little little tidbit you can share over uh, maybe a family supper tonight uh, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, some common organisms that we do see in the veterinary clinic. Um, these are more main hosts or reservoir animals. I really think it's important when we start to talk about ringworm um, how we figure out where that ringworm was actually uh, contracted. So speciating out that fungus is really important when we're using your DTMs or even using your PCRs in clinic. So um, finding out what specific organism that is, is really gonna help treat the infection and then also avoid that further reinfection. So um, you guys can probably read, but the, the main uh, one that we always get a little bit worried about is that microsporum canis. Um, that's usually spread from contact to infected animal or environment, and also the most likely to be an issue with shelter pets or any rescue environments. Um, M. gypsum or um, trichophyton mentagrophytes is definitely um, from contaminated environments. And then um, the mentagrophytes uh, is actually been thought to be exposure to sometimes rodent nests as well. So kind of when the weather warms up, we gotta be a little bit more careful about what's going on outside. So how do we see ringworm um, in our patients? We kind of touched on this a little bit, but that incubation for ringworm can actually take place from one to three weeks. Um, and it is very kind of deceiving. So this little kitty up here is absolutely divine, right? She's got this gorgeous little pink dress on, um, but she could also have some ringworm underneath that beautiful dress. So we need to be careful with that hair coat, what we're looking at, looking for scales or crusts and any sort of slight changes that might not be um, kind of uh, visible to that naked eye. So when we kind of see these changes, how they're gonna look is very mild. So even um, a, a small little papular eruption, small little red raised areas, um, they can be real itchy, erythematous, um, hair loss can happen, alopecia, they could be dome shaped and also too a lot of sometimes um, cases where they have nodules that kind of show up. So be careful with those cute kitties in, in dresses. Um, so once we find out um, we have this 
patient that's coming in to see us or, or maybe we've we've noticed this at home, um, it's really important that we rapidly and also accurately diagnose them. So um, decreasing that potential spread is always going to be number one, one, right? We care um, not just about our, pet, our pets, but also One Health and, and all the, the family members and, and other people that are involved in our lives. And so confirming that type of ringworm is, is going to be a little bit um, difficult because if there aren't many lesions, we need to figure out which test is going to be most appropriate. So I always ask myself when I'm trying to think about these things um, in the hospital that I don't I don't think about the gold standard because we know that fungal cultures and DTMs have been thought to be the gold standard, but there really is not one at all for dermatophytes. So we need to ask ourselves um, what test is going to confirm that presence of active infection or what test is going to help me confirm the absence of it. Um, so really, these are things that we need to kind of figure out um, so we can actually determine the best course of action for everyone involved. So next few slides, we'll talk a little bit more about the diagnostic options, um, some advantages, and then of course disadvantages, because not every test is perfect. Um, so let's talk first about the woods lamp. I think everyone uh, knows about the woods lamp, probably very familiar with it. Um, not a black light like we think of uh, CSI. Um, I'm a big fan of CSI. So um, it was actually invented in 1903, which is pretty crazy. And it's actually looking um, with a specific wavelength of light. And so sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes it's not. And so let me explain about that. Um, it's not as straightforward because there are potential microsporum canis um, species that will fluoresce and then sometimes they don't. So they find that it's estimated about 30 to 80 percent of those are going to fluoresce and that's a huge variety, right? Um, I don't know kind of where I, I stand on that. Um, and the problem is, is if you get a positive, you know, you see something like this kitty up on the screen, you should always follow up with some sort of fungal culture or PCR because you want to make sure that it is confirmed and this is just strongly suggestive of it. Um, and so there's always a high false negative rate because um, of course how we're using the uh, actual woods lamp um, and so using the woods lamp is not going to rule out the infection so if we don't see it but if we do have lesions we're worried about we should always make sure that we're doing something in addition to um, solidify our um, thoughts of is it ringworm or not. And so that's kind of where we go into the next type of test, which is the trichogram. And I like to say it's pretty tricky um, because it definitely takes a little bit of practice. So that recognition of ringworm, how it affects that hair microscopically is really user dependent. Um, so usually they take uh, pieces of hair that are plucked off the animal and they suspend it in mineral oil. And so um, when we look at it under the microscope, most of the time when they're infected, they appear like swollen and frayed and really like fuzzy on the outline of how a normal hair, hair might look like. Um, and so it does take practice. Sometimes there are little fungal areas, um, we say of like rounded cells or even hyphae that we can see, um, but sometimes we don't see that. And so if we do see a positive woods lamp and a positive trichogram, that actually can diagnose ringworm. But if you don't see um, any sort of abnormalities on your trichogram, that does not uh, rule out your ringworm. So another, another addition to the trickiness of these uh, diagnostics. So I'm sure we all know this fungal culture picture that's up on the right, right? Um, I think it's it's something that we've seen not just for our veterinary patients, but also maybe um, when we're uh, working in uh, micro or we see things uh, on TV. And so it is called a DTM, a dermatophyte test in medium. And so <clears throat> the DTM actually is made with special ingredients that inhibit bacterial growth and allow that fungal growth to flourish. And so it also has a special additive that helps us find that ringworm by that red color. And so you can kind of see on that picture, there's like nice little fluffy white cloud-like growths. Um, and so when you're 
actually doing this test, you're gonna pluck um, from the kind of outside of the lesion um, or even, even use a toothbrush to collect the hairs and put it on there. But it takes about two weeks to three weeks for something to even start to grow. Um, so it is a little bit kind of uh, time consuming and frustrating because we kind of have to wait for those uh, fungal species to, to kind of set up shop and, and grow and be happy. Um, and so we always know one those answers fast. And so that time delay um, definitely can be a little bit of a disadvantage, um, but also too sometimes uh, certain dermatophytes that are not pathogenic, so are not causing any sort of disease could potentially change that color red. So that's also a little bit misleading. Um, so it's not very helpful when we start to think about the fungal culture. And so this, I think, um, is one that people think is that gold standard. And so unfortunately, it's not. There's not a gold standard for dermatophytes. Um, and the culture is actually only detecting the presence or an absence of fungal spores. So they're looking only for live dermatophytes to grow on the media, where PCR is looking for any sort of dermatophyte live or dead. And so sometimes that may, might be a little bit more helpful for us. And so in my experience, um, when I used to work uh, in the dermatology department as a technician, um, I would get kind of um, left all the DTMs uh, in my desk drawer and I'd have to look at them every day. And so I know that that's a lot. They want that nice warm area to grow, um, but we need to look at it daily. Um, take Take little samples, uh, look at it under the microscope, and sometimes it's a little bit um, overwhelming with time, and we know that workflow is always important to us in the clinics nowadays. And so that's, I think, where the PCR gets its most utility from. And so it's going to detect that DNA and RNA of that fungal organism. It almost acts like a, a copy machine. So you can amplify the DNA enough that we can look at it, recognize it, and then we can get that answer to you guys within one to three days. So beating out that 21 day uh, wait for that DTM, I think is really important. Um, and so those positive or negative results are always given simultaneously. So you can confidently Confidently tell, you know, that shelter, the rescue group, or that cute little kitty that um, maybe uh, a immunocompromised uh, owner just brought home, and they can actually um, make sure that their kitty gets healthier faster. And so I think this is nice. I wanted to put this in to share with you a testimony about um, Dr. Linda Jacobson, and so she's out of the Toronto Humane Society, and just kind of showing that that way the PCR can really change the management of ringworm and really get our shelter patients in and out fast um, so they can find those loving homes that we all know that they um, need and, and want. So um, there, of course, are always pros and cons to every test. And so we always have to be aware of that a positive PCR is gonna show us that there's a proof of infection, and then a negative is gonna show that there's a proof of absence or it can mean a cure. Um, so there's always a possibility of a positive PCR without any lesions. And that's something we always need to kind of work on and investigate. Are those animals carriers? Um, have they been passed the infection by a fomite? So these are things that we need to um, make sure that we um, figure out are the case and that they're not actually showing um, active lesions um, if they don't have them um, or if we've toothbrushed them or anything like that. So. We start to think about um, the shelters and the advantages of PCRs. You know, obviously the stability of the growth is important and the viability um, is something that surpasses those DTMs. And then of course, too, um, the PCR is gonna be a, a high correlation with culture results. So if you ever do have a PCR that's positive, um, most likely um, in kind of experimental cases, we've shown that cultures also correlate with that. So really nice also to, Include your woods, woods lamp, include that you know microscopic examination of the cat hairs, um, all utilized along with either a culture or PCR, because we want to get the, the widest breadth of, of what's happening with these cases. And so, of course, too, saving turnaround time, um, saving time for all of us. Um, so from receipt to the lab to getting that uh, answer into your hands as fast is gonna clear adoptions or even um, those poor exposed animals from being secluded from their family members. Um, and even also to that confirmation of treatment success. So um, I did wanna share this one uh, kind of uh, little tidbit of knowledge. There was about 104 exposed cats. And so um, they found that 
determining ringworm to clear it, they were actually able to save 14 days to um, adoption. So 20 Canadian dollars per cat, which is a total of 15,000 Canadian dollars. So I think that that just speaks volumes about how we can um, help in every situation, um, shelters or individual animals. So let's talk a little bit about um, another study that we had from our shelter kitties. I just wanted to show you some other things that um, people have been working on. And so this is a study from veterinary dermatology. And so there's a couple of things that they've done research about the usefulness um, in certain medications. And so they wanted to see how we could prevent in contact cats from acquiring the ringworm infection from those um, that had been exposed or even becoming culture positive. So what they did is they used 58 cats with um, the microsporum canis uh, infection, and then they had 32 uninfected or um, bonded pairs um, or litter mates actually. And so they were treated with a combination of uh, itraconazole uh, and then twice weekly lime sulfur dips. And so what they found was that combination in that um, uh, dosage, they were actually able to show that it was safe, effective, and no other um, animals that were uninfected developed lesions or became culture positive. So that's something uh, wonderful that we can kind of um, see the kind of change over um, many years of what ringworm was thought to, to kind of be very um, difficult to get rid of. So PCR um, panel that we have um, here, and so one that uh, Antec is called the fast panel ringworm PCR, it is a little bit more kind of specific and comprehensive than any other test out there. And so many labs, of course, have PCR tests, but this one sets them apart because they can actually speciate out the microsporum gypsum and then that trichophyton or T-men tag that I uh, talked about. And so specifically with our canine and feline patients and then rabbits, small rodents, and then also the equine. And so this, of course, important that we figure out the environment the soil, where the infection came from, and how we can actually stop the transmission or stop the continuing of infection um, to go from animal to animal or even um, animal to people. So really nice that it is able to be a little bit more comprehensive than what we're used to. So when you are going to submit um, a sample, you know we can um, do something that's very similar to our DTMs that probably you're familiar with. And so the collection is the same. All samples with the PCR are stable. So um, you can submit both at the same time. If you want to submit a DTM with the PCR, um, you can get those plucked hairs. Um, we need a minimum of 10 uh, skin scrapings, any crusty lesions that appear to be potentially fungal the better um, you can even take nail bed clippings as well and send those off to us so um, you can send the whole toothbrush to us um, what have you if you feel like there's a nodule or an abscess too that might be uh, infected uh, fungal wise um, you can send that fluid off to us too so we'll take all the crusties so now we know that ringworm looks how it looks. Um, we know how to test for it, the different diagnostics that are available. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about some of the treatment options. And we have a couple of slides uh, until we get to our next um, kind of example of one of our cases. And so the three main treatments are gonna be whole body, systemic, and environmental. So let's talk a little bit more about the whole body. Um, I know a lot of people are familiar with the lime sulfur dip, kind of a little stinky. Um, I never appreciated the smell, um, but based on the current dermatology consensus, the recommended um, kind of therapy is going to be those twice weekly lime sulfur dips. Unfortunately, I know very stinky. Um, enoconazole baths are great. Myconazole or even chlorohexidine combinations for the treatment of ringworm has also been approved um, and recommended. And so localized treatment with uh, chlorotrimazole, which were very common um, in human uh, kind of topical over-the-counter treatments, myconazole, um, there's a lot of information that documents its effectiveness, but they never are good as a sole therapy. So if you are gonna do some sort of um, leave on rinse or topical, the recommended or is, is gonna be that lime sulfur or enoconazole. Um, hy uh, hydrogen peroxide, we have a lot of uh, new um, 
things on the market, accelerated uh, products that are like uh, Climbasol and Terbinafin shampoos. And so those definitely show promise, but um, still need a lot more studies to kind of work on to show the efficacy of it. Um, I know some people prefer to kind of try different things rather than medicated um, baths. And so that's kind of where the last few came um, up on the list here, the essential oils and then the pythium. Um, and so essential oils, I think there has been a really uh, increased interest over the past few years as a um, almost as an alternative because a lot of drug resistance and antibiotic and antifungal um, issues. And so um, I think the jury still is, is still out. There's not much scientific data to support it, um, but it is something that um, is widely used across not just the United States, Canada, um, but also the world. And so a weird thing, Pythium, when I saw that up there, um, it's kind of a, a, an interesting substance. And so I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but um, it's been used in agriculture to control fungal infections in plants. Um, and so the way that it works is it actually consumes uh, the fungus so um, it can actually uh, grow and uses it for nutrients. So there was a study um, out of the Czech Republic that talked about it. And so they found that there was a rapid loss of these fungal organisms um, on these dermatophytes infected hairs. And so two formulations uh, commercially, but only available in the Czech Republic uh, as of now. So maybe in the future, that could be something that um, other companies can work on. So I just thought that was pretty interesting as an alternative as well. Systemic treatments, um, I think, are, are much nicer than a, a, a lime sulfur dip, but of course, um, they're much appreciated especially when it comes to the ease of dosing um, and compliance. I know it's very difficult for me with my animals to remember on a daily basis to give them their medications. So we want to make sure that we pick medications that have owner and also pet compliance. Um, if we have to compound it, um, you know, so be it into a flavor or a treat or something like that. There's so many options now on the market. Um, and so the four, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. So itraconazole, ketoconazole, terbinafin, and then graziofulvin. So these are, are definitely ones that we have commonly in most of our general um, practice uh, pharmacies and also that are available pretty readily um, at uh, big brand um, pharmacies as well. When we're choosing a systemic uh, antifungal, I think the most Im important are the effective ones and the safe ones. So itraconazole and terbinafin are gonna be um, the easiest um, when it comes to checking off all those boxes. Um, we could always have some liver issues. Hepatotoxicity is rare with itraconazole, but sometimes the liver enzymes could be elevated. So we need to be a little bit cautious. Um, so uh, terbinafin is, is definitely a good to go uh, antifungal um, dogs sometimes have hepatotoxicity with it, but cats um, mostly do not, and it's very cost effective. So um, I know that that has been one of my favorites just kind of going forward. Graziofulvin used to be pretty common in like rescue groups and pocket pets, but it seems to be fallen out of favor um, and terbinafin has been picked up um, just due to the availability and cost. Um, so I, I, I kind of like those on the top of my list. And so I don't know if you guys have uh, remembered Lufenuron, um, kind of known as Sentinel um, out there or program. And so I kind of call it the flea uh, birth control because what it is, it's a drug that disrupts that chitin synthesis. So chitin is really part of that exoskeleton um, in those arthropods. And so that outer cell of the fungus also has chitin. So we think of fleas with chitin, but also um, dermatophytes and fungus have chitin in those outer cell walls. So pretty interesting when um, this kind of came about. And so unfortunately, um, it really has no place for the treatment. It doesn't enhance efficacy or any sort of uh, prevention or altering of the course of the infection. So um, it was a great uh, kind of collaboration of, of studies that were out there, um, but just didn't seem to, to do well. And then also too, when we start to talk about antifungal vaccines, this, this seems promising, right? Uh, a study kind of showed vaccinated animals, um, they didn't develop that 
kind of very severe disease. Um, they only had just mild scaling. Um, and then also they had another study that showed uh, there was no response of the vaccine um, as sole therapy. So I think more clinic kind of clinical trials and clinical data needs to come up with this um, to formulate a little bit better of an antifungal vaccine. Um, and this probably is only going to be helpful for adjunct therapy. So in addition to that Lyme dip or that itraconazole dose um, that you're going to be giving. So uh, sorry to be the, the bearer of bad news. So when we're thinking about um, kind of the biggest discussions that we have with pet owners, um, and especially us um, just kind of being exposed to animals all the time, um, is that environmental kind of contamination. So what happens when that sweet kitty that was just adopted um, is PCR positive for ringworm? So we obviously don't want to overwhelm owners, but our, our primary aim is really to minimize that risk of disease transmission um, to people and then also other animals. So education, um, kind of talking about how that transmission of ringworm happened, um, what are the potential factors with fomites, um, and what we can do for faster cure and accurate monitoring is really going to be key when we start talking about the PCR. So, you know, I did mention about, you know, a several week incubation and so there's actually evidence that active infection starts even much sooner than maybe two to three to four weeks. Um, so contact time, that micro trauma that we talked about are gonna be those one um, kind of things needed for that disease development. So um, really when we start to think about um, complicating management and treatment, it's, it's definitely not something that we, that we want to do. And so that kind of goes into how we need to make sure that pets are away from others, um, maybe away from other immunocompromised people. Um, everyone always asks, how long is my pet contagious? Um, you know, when could they go back to their regular routine? When can I take them to daycare? When can I take them into the office or um, grooming or traveling? So we need to make sure that these, um, these guys are really gonna be considered contagious for about three weeks, even if we have aggressive therapy happening kind of in the background. So um, really limiting contact with people, other pets, um, maybe even other areas of the house. So um, you never hear about maybe dermatophytosis being the cause of death of an animal, but um, there's definitely been issues where symptoms reoccur and reinfection happens if a pet's a carrier. And so that's definitely not something we wanna draw out uh, and have a long um, issue. And so that sometimes too, we need to make sure that we're taking that consideration for these animals. You know, obviously we don't wanna lock them in a room for a month, um, you know, behavior problems, socialization problems can can definitely affect, the, affect us long uh, term. And so that balance of decreasing risk um, and then also quality of life and animal welfare are really ideal when we start to think about the infectious, contagious, or even zoonotic risks that we're dealing with. So really an, an important reason that PCR is going to be that faster alternative to that DTM, helping speed up, you know, that process of decreasing isolation and even kind of hold times um, in shelters and a lot of the rescue organizations uh, in those infected animals. So this is the fun part. I wanted to look at a case with you guys. I know we have a little bit of time. I, I wanted to get to some of your questions if you did have some. And so... We got to include Camille and Brigitte. And so these guys were actually um, found in um, a little box that uh, someone brought in from the shelter, uh, to the shelter, excuse me. Um, they were abandoned kitties that um, mom was not able to take care of. And so they were exposed to a positive ringworm cat with lesions, unfortunately. And so they needed to kind of get that okay to be adopted out and kind of the next steps because there was a young little girl that was interested in adopting one of these uh, kitties um, and that was Camille. And so Camille was able to get uh, an examination by her shelter vet and so everything looked normal. They did the regular diagnostics they would do, make sure that she was parasite free and, and free of FELV and FIV. Um, and so she had a small little lesion on her neck. So they were able to uh, do the PCR and because um, there was exposure to the ringworm cat and then um, the potential household that wanted to adopt her had small children, we wanted to make sure that she 
was um, taken care of and um, speciated out. So that's why the PCR was performed to actually figure out, you know, what is this ringworm? Is it the one that is, you know, pretty contagious and one that we're very worried about zoonosis, or is it one that maybe we um, have in the soil or contacted by the environment? And so, unfortunately, it was the microsporum canis, the the one that we're always concerned about. And so, she did get her systemic therapy with her benefin. Um, she did get her topical therapy uh, of lime sulfur dip. So she was a little stinky, rotten egg for a little bit before she was adopted into her new home. Um, and what they did was is they uh, performed a negative, or they performed a PCR and made sure it was negative. Um, um, to be confirmed of that mycological cure. So there is a consensus statement that came out of uh, Wasava in 2017. And so treatment is continued usually until the resolution of clinical signs and mycological cure is achieved. And so what that means and what that's defined as is in cats and dogs, it's defined as two negative fungal cultures taken one to two weeks apart. And so a negative PCR assay from a treated cat um, is also another means uh, of confirming that mycological cure. So I do believe that Camille is, is living her best life um, in Huntington Beach, California, um, and she uh, is probably spoiled rotten uh, now. And so that was all I had for you guys. Um, are there any questions that I can take or anything that... Thanks, Dr. Let me take a look here at some of our questions that we have. So um, uh, Melinda did ask, can we get a copy of this presentation? I believe um, it will be shared in a follow-up email and available on video. So uh, that should answer your question there. Um, I do have a question from Nicole. So I got a negative PCR and thought all was good, but then a week later, the culture came back positive. In that case, what does that mean? So, well, let's kind of take it out a little bit separate. So the negative um, PCR, um, did we, I guess there could be a couple of different things. So the DTM is always gonna tell us if there's an alive dermatophyte. Um, so there's definitely proof of infection there. Um, did we use the same sampling techniques for each one? Um, did we pluck the same areas? That could be kind of the, the concern for the this discordant results. Um, so, yeah, we can always talk a little bit more offline about that and what the lesion looked like and maybe what it speciated out on the DTM. So um, usually shouldn't happen in those cases. Most of the time, the PCR is going to be kind of that um, more specific uh, and sensitive uh, fact of anything. So um, I'd be curious to know just what the DTM um, showed positive for or if it was read in a lab or read in house. Um, you know, there could always be contaminants too. Sometimes saprophytic organisms can overgrow um, and cause some um, positives to show up. So yeah, we can always chat about it afterwards. Love, love a good crusty dermatophyte. <laughs> okay, next question. Just a clarifying question. In the study with the 32 uninfected kittens, they treated them with AS. Well, well excuse me, sorry. They treated them AS as well with the lime sulfur dip as a preventative. Okay, let's go back into here. Um, I believe so they were using the itraconazole, it was at 10 mg per kg, and then it was um, alternating uh, the lime dips. Um, I can always send you that study um, and I can have the link to it. Um, it is a PDF that's uh, I think a free download, so um, we can delve in further about it. Um, but it was mainly just to see if if the infected animals did actually um, transmit that infection over and, and they weren't able to do that um, with the preventive the, of the ITRA and the Lyme dips. So the main focus was just treating those animals, but also too on the other um, was to see if it was transmissible. So good question. Great, thank you. Um, do FELV or FIV positive cats with Sorry, positive cats with, will take longer to cure with treatment than negative cats. How long after cure will PCR still be positive? So I don't know specifically with the FIV or FELV um, how long that affects. I'd have to look and see if there are any sort of studies that document that if it is longer. Um, but I do know like when we do have um, a, a negative PCR, that's going to be just as an equivalent as a negative DTM. So we want those two, D two DTMs or 
PCRs within two to three weeks. Um, and so most of the time, you'll probably have a PCR that might be negative even before the DTM, uh, depending on where you're plucking and where you're kind of looking at the lesions. Um, um, but I'll have to look in to see where that FIV, FLV, how long, if they've ever done any studies to see if, if it does um, affect the length of the PCR, because that, that's something I'm, I'm not familiar with. I know I know someone who who knows a little bit more about PCRs and their diagnostics um, kind of department. So I'll reach out to him for sure and get back to you with that. Great question. I never thought of it that way. Great, thank you. So where did you get the follow-up sample from presumed cured cat? Are we talking about Camille? I would I would say, um, and so I believe they used the toothbrush method on Camille in that specific shelter, um, and so they were able to follow up that way um, with her PCR. And I do believe it was it was two times. Um, her stay was, I think, a little bit extended um, just because um, of the intake. And then she did go to a foster home in between um, before she was adopted out. So I think um, I think it was just the toothbrush method that they used both times. Great, thank you. Can you speak to the difference between M. canis and M. gypsum as far as zoonotic risk and need for isolation? I mean, I feel like sometimes we we look at M. canis maybe a little bit more um, dangerously. Um, I do remember when I was in vet school, we would kind of joke around, you know, if there was a, some sort of, you know, area that had all the animals, you know, you'd probably have to just tear everything up and just um, throw everything away. Um, I think sometimes that it's, it's, both very kind of dangerous to have an M. canis versus an M. gypsum um, kind of infection. So I would probably treat them, um, you know, with with the same kind of gravity of the situation um, and be really good about, you know, disinfection. Um, a lot of the time too, the, the consensus statement talks about kind of air filtrations um, and kind of what they found with the, the fomites that way um, and with the uh, actual ability of those hyphae to follow through, um, through the the vent system, um, but I think disinfection um, and taking care of the fomites, uh, the animals treating them, isolation is, is probably going to be used the same way, either M. canis or, or M. gypsum, in my opinion. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, our next question, is there a preferred cleaner for killing spores on stainless steel kennels? We've had cats, kittens that have taken several months to get two negative cultures and one thought was that the spores are sticking around longer because they're actually on the kennels. Hmm. Interesting. You know, I do see a lot of places using that rescue um, with the kind of accelerated like hydrogen peroxide and a lot of the kind of newer um, cleaners that they're using instead of using bleach. Um, I know in the consensus, the recommendation is still that one to 10 of the chlorine bleach on there, um, but I'll have to see maybe do a little research out there to some of my friends um, and see what they found to be most effective. Um, but I still feel that it's that chlorine bleach that's gonna be the most ideal in these situations. Great, thank you, Dr. Lopez. We did have one last question talking about how to treat the environment, but I think you just addressed that in the last question. Yeah, and then what I can do too is I can attach uh, that Wasava consensus statement on there. Um, it's a long read. It's probably about uh, maybe 80 pages, but it's really great at the end. They kind of um, uh, make everything a little bit more like stepwise and it's more in discussion form towards the end. So it talks more about, you know, disinfectants, um, how to dose the medications, what is the most ideal um, situations for um, using each medication or um, even some of the, the other studies that they've kind of put together retrospectively. So um, we can also attach that as well in our, our follow-up email. Perfect. Well, thank you, Dr. Lopez. I don't see any other questions. Um, oh, actually we have one more, sorry, that just popped in. Um, a cat with no lesion, but hair comes out with slightest tug and can easily cause complete bald area. There's a lot of dandruff on the cat. Can this be ringworm? I mean, 
absolutely. I always used to say like, if it looks like ringworm, it's probably stopped, but you should probably do a tape scrape and a DTM, um, just kind of rule out all those things. Um, so I think it'd be nice to rule out kind of like the big issues and the kind of zoonotic issues and then kind of go from there. But, um, you know, if it is something, you know, staff related, great. Um, you know, if it does something that, um, you know, warrants topical therapy, but I would be more concerned. Um, we haven't ruled out kind of other things first. So I would probably say, do your tape scrape DTM um, and then kind of work, work the pet up that way. So. Great. I think that's it for questions. So uh, I, should I hand it back over to you, Virginia? Absolutely. You can go ahead. There are a couple other questions, if you don't mind. Can I jump in and, and answer those? I'm, I may be seeing something a little bit differently than you do. Um, some of these, I think, are coming from non-veterinary attendees. So, um, one, a cat with no lesions, but hair comes out with the slightest tug and can easily cause a complete bald area. There's a lot of dandruff. Could this be ringworm? Right. That was the one I just answered about kind of making sure that we're ruling out you know, ringworm, but also, you know, following the, their veterinarian's recommendations, but tape, scrape, DTM, so ruling out bacterial kind of issues, any sort of fungal or even mites or anything like that. So those are our big things. And that's the problem with skin disease, which makes us so frustrated, not just like as a veterinarian, but also to myself as a pet owner, everything looks the same. So we have to kind of go stepwise through and figure out what is it before we have a nervous breakdown. All right, um, and then the other question, and I'm sure this is coming from somebody at a cattery. Um, there's um, tests available outside of veterinary medicine. Um, I do believe um, there is uh, some sort of uh, kind of shelter program that we kind of uh, talk about with Antec and the ringworm PCR. Um, if they have a local veterinarian, maybe they can reach out to them, but maybe if, if they wanna reach out to us, um, we'd be happy to, to answer their questions specifically, kind of one-on-one -on -one maybe. Okay, all right. Um, so those, there are a few that still have a couple of questions, but we'll, I'm gonna just ask them to go ahead and email those to me and I'll forward them on to you just cause we're, we're getting close to the end of time. Um, so I do want to thank everybody so much for attending. Um, Dr. Lopez, thank you so much. Um, I remember when I was in practice, ringworm was just, <laughs> I've never, I've never been um, susceptible to it, but I've worked with, you know, coworkers that, I mean, if the cat even walks by the clinic, they break out. So, and it's terrible. So, um, and yeah, the two week wait was always a big, you know, we didn't have the PCR when I was in practice. So this is an, a, a, just a, an excellent tool. I do have one quick question. And this is a question about the difference between a woods lamp and a black light. Yeah. Is a black light, is a black light not effective at all? So no, just because of the different wavelength. And so it can kind of falsely um, get us happy that it's maybe a negative or a positive. Okay. So I would say woods lamp, get it, don't use the black lights. Um, it's gonna okay. give you that kind of false hope, so. All right, okay, sorry. I just had to throw that one in there because I know that has been a question, uh, an age old question. All right, so um, I just wanna thank you again. Um, can we cross to the next um, to the next slide real quick? Yeah, absolutely. All right, and I just want to remind everybody, and this is important because Antec is one of our sponsors, which we are so grateful for. Our um, webinar, not webinar, our symposium coming up this summer, June, uh, July 8th and 9th. Um, it is going to be live in Gainesville, Florida, at the University of Florida, but there is also a virtual option and registration we're hoping will be open in the next few days so please keep an eye um, it's going to be a day and a half um, the first day is a half day it's going to be focused primarily on updates in FIP treatment diagnosis etc and then the second day is just going to be a uh, kind of a, a broad range of different feline related health topics so um, it um, it definitely is going to be worth your time even if you can't travel um, it will be open virtually. Next slide. 
Awesome. All right. So just again, thank you to Antech not only for doing this webinar, but also for being an awesome sponsor for our symposium. And uh, we do appreciate their support so much uh, that the that funding does help us provide the educational part of our mission statement. So we definitely appreciate that. In terms of providing our primary mission and supporting feline health studies, um, obviously we depend on donations from our uh, attendees, from uh, supporters. And so if you would like to make a donation, please visit the website www.everycat.org. Um, there's a place where you can click on different ways to give and you can choose uh, how you want to give. Remember, um, we appreciate every dollar, whether it's $10 or $10,000. So I think that's pretty much all we've got. Um, again, please, uh, I will be sending um, CE certificates in a couple of days to uh, all of the veterinary people that need them. I'll remind you again, if you did register and did not include your license number and state, please email that to me. Virginia at everycat.org um, so that I can get those uh, uploaded so it'll be on your CE record with uh, AAVSB. Um, and then again, you can you can email questions and I can forward them on to Dr. Lopez. So any anything else you want to say, Dr. Lopez? No, thank you guys so much for attending. And if there's anything I can help with, um, please, please reach out. All right, and Denise, thank you so much for doing the questions. Very much appreciated. Thanks for having me. All right, have a great day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks.